I'm pleased to welcome tonight Dr. Rocco Ciappini. Dr. Ciappini is the Director of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and the Medical Director of the Specialty Hospital at Crotchet Mountain Rehabilitation Center in Greenfield, New Hampshire. As a physiatrist, he provides inpatient and outpatient care to individuals with spinal cord injury, brain injury, and other neuro neurological conditions. Dr. Ciappini is a graduate of the Medical College of Virginia and did his residency training in physical medicine and rehabilitation at John Hopkins Medical Center. Dr. Ciappini is a 1996 recipient of the Arthur Stevens Award from Johns Hopkins University and was named Top Doctor in Physiatry by New Hampshire Magazine in 2003. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire and is a certified brain injury specialist as recognized by the National Brain Injury Association. So please welcome Dr. Ciappini tonight to discuss spinal cord injury and obesity versus function. All right. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, thanks for the invitation and thanks to uh, Steve Williams and also Claudine Dejoe for all the help coordinating today, uh, tonight's talk. Uh, it's really, really a pleasure to have this wonderful view. You know, I'm going to show you my view, um, which I think is beautiful too. But this is great, um, except maybe the Fenway Park part, since I'm a Yankee fan. But it is kind of nice to see the lights up. This is, this is my view. Um, I'm at Crotchet Mountain, which is in southern New Hampshire, about uh, uh, halfway between Nashua and Keene, New Hampshire, if people are familiar with that. And uh, Crotchet Mountain is a uh, facility that's been uh, there in southern New Hampshire since the 1950s. Uh, we have um, a school for uh, children with developmental disabilities at Crotchet Mountain. Uh, we also have an inpatient uh, rehabilitation unit that is uh, multiple levels of care from acute rehab through subacute and even skilled nursing care. Uh, so. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about uh, this uh, topic of obesity. I'm going to just show my, uh, my title slide again. Uh, the title is Obesity Versus Function in Spinal Cord Injury, a Case Study. So I have, um, I think, a very interesting case to present. Um, and what was uh, really wonderful for me was the opportunity to really learn a lot through taking care of this patient. Um, I, I feel that I had a very, very strong uh, training in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Johns Hopkins. Um, and we had really good training in spinal cord injury. So we learned about how to care for things like autonomic dysreflexia and uh, neurogenic bowel and bladder. Um, how to deal with people who are coping with their new injury, um, how to create successful transitions, et cetera, et cetera. We never learned one word about obesity and weight management and how this could be a very important um, aspect of a person's overall health and um, function and well-being. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to my patient, um, CCA. She's a 51-year-old woman. She had a motor vehicle accident in February of 2002. And at that time, she was taken to the ER up at uh, Dartmouth and was diagnosed with a C67 uh, incomplete spinal cord injury. She had the surgical screw and fixation and was eventually transferred to Health South in April of 2002. So this is her. Uh, sitting on her bed at home after discharge from Health South in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, at the time of that this picture was taken, she was five foot seven, 164 pounds, and had a bust size of uh, 38C. Um, and it's important to note that she re she was a, um, requiring a lot of Hoyer lift transfers when she returned home, and. Um, she requested from her insurance company a Hoyer transfer that had a, had a scale so she could weigh herself. And this was denied. 
so by the fall of 02, she's already gained 11 pounds, uh, and she's starting to get concerned about her weight. She watches her intake. She, you know, she has not been advised at all about what to do about this problem. And, you know, she does what she thinks she should do is be active. She's doing home PT. She's doing her STEM master bike um, and watching her weight. So she's hoping that that's going to be okay. Um, spring of 03, this is when I actually first met her as an outpatient in my practice. Um, her, her weight had gone up to 195, which was a 31-pound weight gain from the time of discharge. And she had gained four inches um, around her chest uh, for a 42-inch um, bust. Um, at that time, we talked about diet. And she told me she had tried Weight Watchers. And um, we talked about a thing called the Schwartzbein diet. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. but. It's a diet that's kind of uh, low carb, you know, higher, higher protein and um, kind of higher in uh, healthier fats. So she tried that. That didn't really budge her weight. Uh, she continued with the home PT, the STEM master bike. And so um, at, the, at that time, when I first met her, her functional status was that she could do slide board transfers from the uh, wheelchair to either her bed or into a car. Uh, she could do wheelchair push-ups. She, um, she could side bend um, while sitting in her motorized chair and touch the base and then come back to an upright position. She was able to undress her upper body independently, and um, she could bathe in a shower chair with min assist. So by November of the same year, she had um, gone, gone up to um, 210 pounds. She's gained 46 pounds. Um, she's gained six inches across the chest. And um, she, at this point, she's now tried the health fast diet, which didn't work. 1,200 to 1,500 calorie diet without effect. And, but she did tell me in the office visit that, you know, you know if I eat 800 calories a day, I can lose some weight. But how can you eat 800 calories a day? It's, it was next to impossible for her to do that. Um, so you know, at that time, she started aquatic therapy as an outpatient. And she's already beginning to lose function. Uh, she's having more difficulty with slide board transfers, uh, mod assist of two. She's having difficulty because she's feeling too top heavy and she's tippy um, and, can't, and doesn't have enough uh, trunk control. Uh, she can't do the wheelchair push-ups anymore at this point. Uh, and she's unable to do that side bend where she could touch her chair base and come back up. Um, basically, she, she's just becoming more, she's losing function you know, as, we, as we're seeing her. Every, I was seeing her about every few months, and, and these were our check-ins. So by the spring, she had gained um, 62 pounds total. Uh, she's gone up one cup size with her bra. Um, she, tried, she had tried the South Beach diet without effect. And, and now she's beginning to really notice some shortness of breath when she's sitting up at 90 degrees. And, um, Sitting up at 90 degrees is really important for her because uh, that's how she drives. And so as you saw in the picture there, you know, in rural New Hampshire, you have to drive to get anywhere. And she's a very independent, motivated lady who wanted to independently drive herself where she needed to go each day. So um, driving was getting harder because she was getting out of breath. She was still doing her STEM master bike. Uh, at this point, she's now unable to do slide board transfers at all. And um, she's dependent for dressing and showering. And um, she, she really uh, had a, a pretty um, religious uh, tolerant, uh, religious observation of a standing table. She'd get up every day at multiple times during the day because she knew that that was good for her. But she really didn't have the ability to stand like that. 
So by the fall, she's now gained 58 pounds. This is 04. Eight, eight inch increase across the chest. Um, and she's, um, she's eating a 1,000 calorie diet five days a week. This is kind of, she's, you know, I think in the last slide, she had, um, she had a total of 62 pound weight gain. So, whoops. So you can see she's kind of leveled off here with the 58 pound total. So the 1,000 calorie diet five days a week was, was somewhat effective, although very difficult and probably not uh, fully healthy. Um, but, but she's still having a lot of difficulty because of her size. Um, she was very short of breath when sitting up at 90 degrees and had to keep the uh, wheelchair uh, seat, um, seat to back angle at 110 to 120 to really feel comfortable. Um, and at this point, we really looked at the possibility that, you know, of doing something um, surgical for her because, um, you know, we were getting nowhere really with diet and, and attempts at exercise. So we, we started looking into this idea of getting a gastric bypass or a banding procedure. So for people who are not familiar with the gastric bypass, uh, it's called the Roux and Y gastric bypass. It's the uh, most common um, obesity surgery done in the United States. Um, and what, hap what is done is you, you disconnect the majority of the stomach, uh, including all the way up to the, the duodenum. So right here, this part is detached. You make a little pouch for a stomach up here that attaches to the esophagus, so the food comes down this way, bypasses the stomach, goes down here, and then meets up with the intestines as, as it would normally. Uh, and then the stomach and the duodenum are uh, attached in here uh, so that digestive juices can get in and cause digestion. So this is a very effective surgery, uh, not without its risks and complications, but it has, um, it's, it's the most widely accepted surgery for people with obesity. The gastric banding is, uh, has a similar concept, although uh, you're really not detaching anything, you're putting a band around the stomach and creating this pouch. So you have a similar type of pouch, but the food would come down here, kind of get caught up in this pouch, and then slowly empty into the stomach. Uh, the idea behind both of these surgeries is that you're, you know, when a person eats, they're going to get full very quickly with this small uh, gastric pouch. And the, uh, both of the, uh, the uh, by the way, the gastric banding is the primary type of obesity surgery done in Europe, as opposed to the Rue and Y, which is the American uh, uh, style. You know, it's more preferred here. So, and both of them have been shown to um, reverse effects, you know, of, um, uh, to, the, to reverse kind of lipid profiles, so people that have very high cholesterol, high triglycerides, um, people with diabetes, hypertension, you know, a lot of these have been shown to be reversed with both of these surgeries. Um, so that's what we, we started looking into, and we, um, we mostly looked at Dartmouth as a place where this might be done because we thought maybe a teaching hospital would be open to this idea. Um, with uh, someone with spinal cord injury. So now it's December of 04, and she's uh, got a, a total of 62 pound weight gain. Now she's not really fitting into her power chair anymore, and obviously that is affecting her function and her independence. And uh, she's continuing to have the shortness of breath and needing the Hoyer transfers. By uh, July of 05, um, she's having to stop when, you know, when she's driving her car so she can recline her chair um, and breathe, and then she's 
you know, after she catches her breath, she puts her chair back up to 90 and drives a little farther. It's very, very disabling for her. Um, and she was denied uh, for the lap band surgery. So um, the gastric bypass, they didn't even want to consider. They thought maybe a lap band, but she didn't meet the criteria uh, by BMI, the body mass index. So I'm going to talk about BMI in a few minutes, but uh, keep that in mind. She didn't meet the criteria. So we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, so we, we pursued plastic surgery consultation for breast reduction and abdominoplasty. So abdominoplasty is basically liposuction. So uh, that's what we looked at doing. Uh, we did find a surgeon who was willing to do this procedure. And, and we were, um, I was kind of surprised we were able to get the insurance company to agree in October. And by December, she had this surgery. So it was about a year of trying to find somebody who would do this for her. So in mid-January, I saw her for a follow-up after her surgery. And she had, had lost 25 pounds with the surgery and really started noticing improvements in her function. Uh, she found that it was easier uh, to roll in bed. Slide board transfers were something that she was you know, starting to try again. Um, and she could tailor sit on the floor. So she could sit on the floor with one leg out and another leg crossed on top of it, uh, which indicates a decrease in this top heavy tippiness that she was feeling before. Um, so she had some significant improvement uh, in her um, trunk control and some, some function right away. Uh, by March, she was reporting no further shortness of breath when sitting at 90 degrees uh, during driving uh, or when using the stander. Uh, she was able to remove her own socks and shoes independently uh, and uh, could do her own uh, upper body dressing. So she, needless to say, she was delighted. She felt like she had gotten her life back uh, to some extent here. June of 06, uh, she got a, a permobile uh, standing wheelchair, uh, which allowed her to stand when she was at work and also propel her chair in a standing position, uh, things she couldn't have considered before. Uh, breathing was not a problem during standing. Um, by December 06, she was down to 198. And um, in November, November 08, this month, uh, she was 190. So not only was you know, she able to lose some weight with the surgery, but she's able to continue to uh, drop it down gradually over time. So, so, so I think you know, this, that's basically the presentation of the case. This is a, a graph of the weights. Um, I was having a little trouble doing this um, PowerPoint graph here. For some reason, uh, these, these parts wouldn't label, but it's basically spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall. Um, and so you just see the curve. She maxes out, and then she has the surgery, and she just starts coming down. Um, so. So what, you know, what I think that this case really illustrates is um, how difficult it can be to manage weight and how, um, how much weight or increasing weight and just kind of girth can make it very difficult for uh, a person with spinal cord injury to perform ADLs uh, and other activities like driving. So I want to... Um, so, so this, that was the case, and the, you know, her story got me really you know, back to the literature trying to see what was out there because, as I said before, none of this was in my training in residency. And, and I'm interested to see, I know there's some residents here today, I wonder if it's now part of residency training. And um, you know, I'm going to talk about some ideas about management and all, but I, I'd love to hear um, you know, other people's thoughts and experiences on this subject. So the first thing I looked at was BMI. So for people who are not familiar with BMI, 
It's a number that's calculated from a person's height and weight, and it's an indicator of body fatness. So what it is is you use, um, uh, it's uh, kilograms over meters squared is the formula. So it's not in inches and, and feet and uh, pounds. But if, if anyone were, wanted to go to Google and put in BMI, you'll, you can find a BMI calculator and find your own BMI. Uh, you can put in feet, inches, pounds. You don't have to be metric to do it. It does it for you. Um, it's used by physicians and dietitians to assess a person's risk for developing obesity-related disease. And, and there's some guidelines for, you know, where people should fall in here. And if you're, you know, if you're 18 and a half to 24.9, you're considered normal. Um, 25 to 29.9 is overweight, and over 30 for a BMI is obese. So in the journal Spinal Cord, uh, Buckold says that uh, in the spinal cord injury population, BMI is an insensitive marker of obesity. Uh, this may be due to potential measurement error and to the inability of BMI to distinguish between fat and fat-free mass and to measure body fat distribution. So Jones, in the archives of PM&R, uh, compared 19 men with spinal cord injury and 19 controls, uh, people without spinal cord injury. They looked at BMI. They looked at dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. Now that is essentially um, a radiology study that can distinguish between fat and lean tissue. And, um, and they, they found that the groups were similar in, uh, with regards to BMI. Um, but the people with spinal cord injury had um, a, a lower lean tissue mass, uh, more fat mass, uh, and a higher uh, body fat percentage. So, so you're talking about two groups of people with BMIs that are similar. So you plug in height and weight, you get the same number, but the distribution is, so, is very different. There's more, you know, there's less lean tissue. And lean tissue is the, is the tissue that has more metabolic activity to burn energy. So Cosina uh, did a study in, in, uh, published in Sports Medicine in 97 where um, they showed that, um, you know, comparing able-bodied men and women to um, active and, sed and, and sedentary SCI uh, uh, patients, uh, the, the people with SCI uh, on average had more body fat. McDonald in the Journal of Spinal Cord Medicine um, did a study um, uh, with uh, 60 patients who were t age 10 to 21. So now we're talking about children and adolescents. Uh, and these people had traumatic spinal cord injury. And they, they were compared to a group that were age, gender, and BMI matched. And, and what they found, they used that DXA test and saw the lean tissue versus the fat tissue, et cetera. And, and they found that the body fat percentage um, in the paraplegic group was 31.4%, uh, tetraplegic 25.7, and controls was 22.9. And then in lean tissue, you're, you see that the, um, the paraplegics and tetraplegics have less lean tissue as well. And um, not to get into all these ratios and all, but basically what the McDonald study shows is that that is uh, that a thing that they showed in the Jones study of adults is also true of kids and um, adolescents. So um, Weaver did a study, uh, and they looked at um, about 8,000 veterans with spinal cord injury, and they used the standard BMI measurements. And then they also adjusted BMI because there's some uh, people that, that write in this field who say that in spinal cord injury, you really should be um, taking the, the uh, guidelines and, and just dropping them down about 10%, and that would be a more accurate measure. And what they found was that uh, the um, overweight and obese 
uh, go up a lot, especially obese. With the standard measurement, they found 20% of the uh, patients to be obese. With the adjusted measurement, they got 31%. So it's a BMI underestimates the uh, obesity uh, in spinal cord injury. And I think that, that going back to my patient, CCA, you know, she had a BMI of 35 when they denied her for the, for the lap band um, because the cutoff was 40. But I think that, you know, they weren't, they weren't thinking about this information here about body fat distribution, et cetera. So, um, you know, lean tissue and fat tissue have different metabolic rates, and this translates into the fact that um, people with um, spinal cord injury have a lower basal metabolic rate, especially in people with high tetraplegia. And in Monroe's study, uh, they looked at 10 male spinal cord injured patients and compared them to 59 age match controls. And they looked at the 24 hour energy expenditure, which they found to be lower in individuals with spinal cord injury. They found spontaneous physical activity was lower, metabolic rate was lower, as was the thermic effect of food, which is basically kind of the energy that's consumed just digesting your food. So um, Buckholz and Panchars state that uh, measured resting metabolic rate is 14 to 27 percent lower in persons with spinal cord injury. Um, and it could be due to decreased fat-free mass and, sympathetic, and decreased sympathetic nervous system activity. So Maki et al. Um, published a study where they looked at anthropometric measures, which is just kind of um, taking a tape measure around the um, abdomen and looking at the circumference. They also looked at the BMI, the body fat percentage, and the waist to height ratio. And they found that of those, all those uh, different things that they measured, that the abdominal circumference was the most closely associated with lipid profile. So one of the concerns uh, with uh, obesity is uh, abnormal lipids, so chole total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol being high, HDL or the good cholesterol being low, um, and um, you know what, what's been found in some other studies is that HDL uh, is is lower in people with spinal cord injury. And what was found in this Maki study is that um, the bigger the abdominal girth uh, or abdominal circumference, uh, the lower the HDL. Edwards did a study and uh, published it in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They looked at 15 subjects with spinal cord injury and 16 controls. And, and they, what they did in this study was interesting. They, they did a, a CAT scan uh, at the L4-5 level, so right across kind of the lower belly, um, and were able to look at, uh, by CAT scan, they were able to look at the fat that is subcutaneous or right under the skin versus the fat that's deeper, which is uh, called visceral um, fat, or here they're calling it VAT, visceral adipose tissue. Um, and they also did a waist circumference at three levels. They did it right at the lowest rib and then at the um, iliac crest, kind of like the top of the hips, and then between. They, find, they found that the uh, people with spinal cord injury had um, higher um, visceral adipose tissue uh, and um, higher uh, total adipose tissue. But what's interesting here is that the waist circumference at all three levels, whether they measured it here, here, or here, correlated with the visceral adipose tissue in both groups. Now, I don't know that that's you know, earth shattering to people that you know, the, the bigger you are around the middle, the more fat may be there. But I think what they were able to show by CAT scan was that, that it correlated with the visceral or the deeper fat tissue. 
And in, it's, it seems to me that waist circumference is probably a better measure than BMI. Or using waist circumference with adjusted BMI uh, may be a more accurate measurement. So, you know, what, what do you do for weight management anyway? You know, what does anybody do? And um, it, it is a, a very challenging problem, as everybody knows. We have a, an obesity epidemic in, in this country and in much of the developing world. And really what we have at our disposal is education about the importance uh, of weight management for health. Uh, we have a diet. Um, and there's as many types of diets as there are dietitians or people who can write a book, you know. So it's very, it's hard to know what's the best diet. There's exercise and there's surgery. And so what we don't really know in the spinal cord injury population is, you know, what is the best diet? what is the best exercise program, and we don't really know much about the surgical options because there really haven't been many examples of it or studies of it. So Chen uh, did, uh, published a paper in Spinal Cord in 2006 where they looked at 16 people with spinal cord injury uh, who were overweight or obese, and they, they put them in a 12-week weight management program uh, that included time calorie displacement diet. So that is, as best I can understand that diet, it is um, this idea that, that um, calorie um, dense foods should be replaced by foods that are less dense in calorie. Um, so, you know, it could take you the same amount of time maybe to eat a Snickers bar as an apple, but you would get a lot more calories from a Snickers bar. So what you're trying to do is displace things with, you know, less calorie-dense foods. So it turns out to be more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains. It's a story that we've heard many times. But they, so this is the diet that they used. And they used exercise, um, although they didn't define it very closely what the exercise program was. So. They didn't say if this was resistance training or aerobic exercise. It was basically just advising people to exercise 30 minutes a day. Uh, and they, they did a group education and support program, which, um, which met every week. And there was a different topic discussed each week um, about uh, diet, health, exercise, et cetera. And they found that in, in these people, who um, were um, fairly removed from their injury. I think they, the average was like nine, 10 years post-injury. Um, these people were able to lose uh, three and a half kilograms, which is um, something like seven or eight pounds uh, by uh, week 12. And they were mostly able to keep it off by week 24. So you can see the number went down a little bit. Um, but this is at least a beginning. It's, a, it's an idea about a program in which people can, can really um, lose some weight, uh, and they were able to show that. Um, they felt in their paper that the, um, that the group education and support part was possibly the most important part, and that's not surprising. Um, I think that is what really helps to keep people on track, checking in weekly. Um, there's a new study that's uh, been being put together in Canada by Martin Guinness, uh, and they, this was published in Spinal Cord this year. Uh, it's called The Study of Health and Activity in People with Spinal Cord Injury, or SHAPE, SCI. Their goal is to establish evidence-based uh, physical activity guidelines for individuals with SCI. You know, at this time, I, I am not aware of um, guidelines that say, you know, what, what is the best kind of exercise to maintain fitness and appropriate weight uh, for people with SCI. And, and I was able to come across this paper uh, by Ali Dean uh, in obesity surgery in which they reported the first case of an individual uh, with paraplegia 
who had a, a Roux and Y gastric bypass. This was done at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and I, I uh, contacted Dr. Aladdin and um, just asked if there, you know, if there was uh, any report of others, others who've had this surgery, uh, especially were there any tetraplegics who had this surgery? And his response was that um, this is the only person he's aware of that's ever had this surgery. And this was a VA patient, and uh, it re he said it took quite a bit to get the VA to agree to this. But in the case report, you can see that there was a significant improvement in this gentleman's um, function after this surgery. So it's a beginning. And I, you know, I think in closing tonight, I just you know, want to put out some recommendations. But I, I really think the Q&A uh, could be interesting to share ideas and experiences. Um, rehab professionals uh, need to incorporate teaching about weight management, uh, including prevention, uh, in the rehab process for individuals with SCI. So that should start at the acute rehab uh, level and work, you know, and be incorporated into the office visits as well. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to maintain weight than it is to, to lose it once you've put it on. Um, and uh, more research is needed on the best diets to maintain weight in SCI. Um, more emphasis on and access to exercise. Um, I think that, you know, that's something that's very difficult uh, for people that uh, have spinal cord injury who live maybe, maybe in Boston it's not as much of a problem, but in other parts of the country uh, where you're not as close to big cities and, and uh, you know, lots of health clubs and all, it's very hard to find good, um, safe places to exercise. Um, research is needed on the appropriate use of uh, surgical interventions. You know, is it even safe to do? You know, we're not sure. But I think that uh, the evidence is there uh, in the general population, and I think that uh, there's a need there in the, in, for some people with spinal cord injury. Uh, and, and, you know, I think education of insurers is really important as well. Um, you know, I don't know that my patient's story would be different if they would have approved the scale for the Hoyer lift, but it would have helped her to keep tabs on her weight right up front from day one. Um, but, you know, that's not just about getting a scale for a Hoyer lift. It's also about getting uh, approval for ongoing therapies for people, you know, you know, in the, quote, maintenance phase, you know, they, you know people needing health club memberships or uh, access to aquatic therapy um, and how this, you know, can keep people more functional, independent, healthier. It, it's good for the people and it, and it should, you know, save the insurers money as well. So thank you for your attention and, and that's really the end of the uh, talk tonight. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to know oh, yes. um, if one has a tremendous amount of muscle spasm, does that include, is that incorporated as exercise involuntarily? Is that considered exercise? Involunt involuntary? Involuntary. No, it's, it's a very good question. Um, I, I don't consider it to be exercise in the sense of what I'm talking about here where, you know, the, the sort of exercise that may help to um, maintain weight. It does uh, tend to maintain muscle, um, preserve muscle size, you know, but not, uh, you know, I don't think it's the kind of exercise that burns enough calories to, you know, offset your intake. Okay. Oh, yes. uh, I want to just proclaim things that have happened in my life. <laughs> by doing what I was told to do by a pastor, by a naturopath, before I had the onset of my disease. 
I'm doing the same thing now, but it's not working as well. Uh, the thing I did was called proper food combining diet. And that's almost a vegan diet, if you will. Uh -huh. But you eat watermelon when you eat watermelon. You eat cantaloupe when you eat cantaloupe. You eat honeydew when you eat honeydew. You don't eat them together. They don't digest together properly. So you separate what you do. You don't have uh, potatoes and meat at night. You have meat and vegetables. No meat and potatoes. You don't have hamburgers with buns. You have a hamburger and a vegetable. It will digest. If you read the book, it makes sense. Take it from one who did it. I was 158 pounds upon gradu graduation from high school. I was again 158 pounds 20 years later. I was again 158 pounds 15 late years later. Then this hit, and it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And then the other thing I used was a three foot wide trampoline. It was with the uh, mm -hmm. Dr. S. Samuel W. West uh, Rehab, if you call it. It was a, a system of standing on the pad, going up and down for 30 seconds the first day, a minute the next day, minute and a half the next day until you're up to 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, then you can jump on the trampoline. And it worked. I was up, I was doing this stuff, sitting on the stupid trampoline, bouncing on it with my butt, and it got me to stand up and bounce on it for that little extra I needed. It took me a month to get through it, so I was walking. Two months later, I was walking with a cane, and I never kept it up, because I just assumed I was done with it. And you can't assume you're done once you start something. You always go on the presumption, if you did it once and you needed it, you better do it the rest of your life. And just do it, it works. I know it works, I just don't know how to get up, standing on the trampoline, secure on the trampoline and go up and down again. And I want to get there. I'm almost there. Mm -hmm. I'm standing up, holding on to the rail at the, the uh, toilet, <laughs> which is better than it was. Uh -huh. So that's improved in uh, six months' time, seven months' time. And if I can do that, I can put that trampoline down, possibly stand on it and hold that bar and do the exercise that way. I'll figure something out to do it. I'm destined and determined to do it. But those are the things that have worked for me, that have worked for others, and that I'm just sharing my, the experiences I've had. And it did help other people that I worked on. Where they felt pain, I took it from them as I did for myself. Where they had uh, problems with their swelling in their feet, I took it from them by standing on the trampoline going up and down, it reduced the size in the, their feet from the swelling. Uh, it re removed discoloration in their feet from the swelling. It did a plethora of things for people, and it does work. It's up to everybody in here to do it. I can't diagnose anybody, but if you're willing to take a chance and you're willing to look for improvement, those are the best tools I have that I know about. Outside of that, you're on your own. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks for sharing your experience. You're entirely welcome. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I work with a a group of people of higher level of spinal cord injury, and I've been watching people for the last 15 years who who started out in rehab with um, well more of a problem of putting on weight, and so I don't think in rehab a lot of focus is on weight maintenance yeah. to lose. It's more about gaining and keeping your protein intake up. But um, what I'm finding is people are gaining weight. Um, they don't fit in their chairs. 
and insurances are more willing to pay for a new power wheelchair to fit somebody's increased width than the rehab they need. You know, and I don't know what to tell people to do for exercise because it takes some pretty expensive technology to really do any effective techno exercise. So if you have any suggestions, anybody, um, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, it, the first point was the, um, was the difficulty in, in um, maintaining weight, like putting it back on after injury, which is seen in the acute phase. And, and interestingly, this uh, lady, CCA, that I talked about tonight, when she left uh, Health South, uh, she was on a, a regular diet and also was advised to, to use um, Ensure with each meal. So, you know, they were trying to kind of beef her back up, but um, didn't really say what to do, you know, when to stop that, you know. And so, so that is, uh, you know, when is it time to switch gears? Um, and, and I think that it's very challenging to find, a, you know, exercise that everyone can do that's effective. And, and you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I come here to share a story, but I'm by no means the expert. And I don't know if anybody out there, you know, in the audience has some, you know, exercise ideas or prescriptions that they think work for people with high tetraplegia. You know, I'd, I'd be interested. I'd like to just um, share my story. I'm up here on the front. Where, over where here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a C5-6 spinal cord injury, uh -huh. chronic for 25 years. And in starting in 2005, I was able to lose 50 pounds through diet and exercise. And what I did was I did very low calorie diet, yeah. under 1,000 calories a day. Yeah. I did FES bike training, mm -hmm. Nautilus training, and a wheelchair aerobics DVD three times a week and like I said I lost 50 pounds in the course of probably about 10 months and I've kept it off the whole time and I still go to the gym three times a week yeah. so I really think it is a combination of diet and exercise and most of the people at the gym with me are tetraplegics and they've all noticed a decrease in weight yeah in the Fantastic. program it was a program that you were involved in Dr. Williams now did did you notice when you were heavier that you had more difficulty doing things? Yeah, I, actually I started the program because I went to the BMC lecture and I heard all the benefits of activity-based therapy. Yeah. So that's why I said I have to do something because I was losing function, specifically driving, mm -hmm. and my spasticity was increasing. Uh -huh. So I just made a, a goal to get, get active and it really paid off. It's a great story. So is there, Steve, do you have something that uh, it's a program that, that people are doing. I'd, lo I'd like to hear that. <laughs> so I think what Kristen was talking about is the um, first five program at the Quincy YMCA. And the Quincy YMCA has done a wonderful job of investing in equipment that people who have paraplegia and quadriplegia are, are able to use. And they have given us um, a uh, staff member who runs an exercise program there, I think it's three times a week, is it? It's three times a week in the evenings. And so this person is there to assist people onto the equipment. There's a uh, functional electrical stimulation biking and there's adapted uh, weightlifting equipment and uh, quite a bit of equipment, probably 10 pieces of equipment. And it has been a great program, and a lot of my patients have participated, and a lot of people have really um, lost weight, have improved their function, have uh, increased their uh, strength. So I think, it, I think it is valuable for people who live, you know, close by and can get to the YMCA. It is a challenge, like you said, I think, to find um, health clubs that are accessible and that are willing to maybe devote a staff member to helping people who are disabled get onto the equipment, et cetera. But we've been very fortunate with the Quincy YMCA and with Sue Sheehy, who really started the program and it was funded by the Travis Roy Foundation, which was wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the sort of thing that, you know, that people need is, is a place where they can go and they have the appropriate equipment and it's safe and accessible. 
and um, you, you all are fortunate. Are you aware of any other places in the Boston area that have that kind of program? So I don't know of any other place that has as extensive a program, but Claudine was involved in uh, working out with the YMCA so that our patients, when they were discharged from acute so Claudine was uh, instrumental in working out with the YMCA so that when our patients were discharged from acute rehab, they uh, would qualify for low membership fees at the YMCA or for scholarship. And so there was a, a, an accessible Y, I think in Brighton, and in Boston, the one on Huntington Avenue near the MFA. And uh, they both also had pools, I think, and did aquatic therapy programs as well. So that was, uh, you know, and, and I would say that if you don't live in Boston, uh, Claudine and I often just kind of sit and think of these crazy ideas that we want to instrument. And we just call people and ask. And I'm shocked at how often they say yes. And so the Y was very open to that. And so, you know, you could probably approach a YMCA in any of your towns uh, and determine if they're accessible and if they're accessible, uh, if you can gain access. And also then, you know, through the network of the National Spinal Cord Injury Association in either Massachusetts or New Hampshire, you might be able to find therapists who might be willing to uh, volunteer time in the evening rotating to start a program at a YMCA. I also have um, other, your local gym, we have, many people have told us they've just approached their gym and they have got, brought in equipment for people that are using wheelchairs. Um, I know this, again, usually on the South Shore is just where people are, are telling us they've been, but they've brought in equipment and it's usually, like once the gym brings in one piece of equipment, they start building more of a following of people who have a disability who are coming into that gym regularly because now they know they have. So if you have a gym, just call them and ask them what they have for accessible equipment and if they're willing to bring any in for you. I mean, and I would also say that just another gym that I know in the area has provided accessible equipment is the Dedham Racket and uh, the Dedham Racket Club. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the Dedham, say that again. <laughs> The Dedham Health and Racket Club, yes. They've been very receptive to, uh, you know, people with disabilities. And I've had a lot of patients who have gone there as well. Hi. I think um, a lot of the local health clubs, they don't get equipment because the equipment's so expensive. I think what we need to do more is um, have people with disabilities advocate for equipment. It, it should be something in the local gyms and there should be some type of grants out there for the equipment. It's so needed. You know, um, a lot of the gyms, speaking with a lot of gym owners, they say the equipment's so expensive or they don't have the room. I think a lot of them, the owners are afraid of the liability as well. So these, we have to go out and educate the gym owners and talk to them more about where they can purchase the equipment, how to make their um, facility accessible. That's another thing, so. And, and the other thing, Tony, is that, you know, I think the Travis Roy Foundation is a perfect example. There are probably foundations similar to Travis's, and Travis is maybe willing to help fund some equipment at local gyms. You know, it's always worth like putting in an app if there's somebody who could organize a program at one of these places, you know, I'm sure that many of these small foundations around would be very interested in entertaining those applications. Also, the, um, your independent living centers is speaking with the people at the independent living centers to help you to advocate for the equipment. Um, I, Dr. Williams knows I've been working on this for a very long time. At one point, I... Um, developed a business plan for an accessible facility in the Boston area. A lot of the um, accessible gyms are on the outskirts of Boston and there's no transportation. So a lot of the inner city people do not have access other than the rehabs. So it, it's a big issue and it would certainly um, 
help with preventive medicine. And since, you know, people are in the hospital often, but if, you know, you had the, had access to fitness um, equipment and, and good nutrition, then, you know, that would certainly cut down on the cost. <laughs> a week ago Monday, a group of um, fitness instructors from Metro Boston YMCA's held a teach-in at the Constitution in YMCA in Charlestown. And I did not attend, but a number of people from my MS support group did attend. And maybe some of them could tell you about um, the efficacy of that experience. Um, a number of them are here. Rose, do you want to speak about it? Okay, yes, yeah, so I went to the to the program that they had, and they were showing at what happens. I have MS, so it's just like, you know, disability, the spinal things. Anyways, she helped, they helped me to use the equipment in the, at the YMCA. And yes, yeah, so they, they, there are things that can be done at the YMCA, and they were practicing on how to help folk people who need help. So that made it made it good. If you have someone there that can help you, if they know what you need, so you just have to speak up and tell them what you need it. And then I thought it was very nice. Yes. Oh. Okay. So something? Oh. Yeah. Um, my name is Brett. John and I work for a facility in Canton called Journey Forward, which works with spinal cord injuries with uh, exercise-based type recovery. Um, our goal and mission is more <coughs> on, on the recovery side, trying to maintain levels of recovery um, and increase recovery if possible with, uh, you know, a lot of the research is coming out that's saying that just just doing certain activities like load bearing, gait training, um, some of the things they're doing here at Boston Medical with locomotor training with those things as well. So the issues that we've come into is again with this adaptive equipment with the trained staff, everything's one on one, those things, it's expensive. And uh, we're in the process of trying to lower the cost of our, of our program and working to see if we can go insurance routes or if we could through fundraising and through all those aspects. Um, it's difficult because I think the things that like the Quincy Y and those things that are doing, they're doing an excellent job in trying to do it as most cost effective as possible. Um, and with our program, we're trying to be as aggressive and offer the, the latest and the best possible types of recovery that are out there. However, to do that, it's, it's extremely expensive. So trying to bridge the gap and see how, how they can make it possible. But back to the, to the weight aspect is a lot of our clients will come in and either maintain um, what weight they're at or they'll even start to to lose weight um, based on the activities that they're doing and um, working on the different those different everything from vibration training and the load bearing and everything any other questions yes um, on your case study did did she, after her plastic surgery, start a more vigorous exercise routine? No, she, she did not. She. So do you attribute her a slow weight loss following that surgery to um, like a um, decreased body fat to lean body mass ratio that maybe gave her an overall average better I, metabolic I, I think rate? That, that I think that may be the case. And she also did find this caloric intake that worked for her. You know, I, I think it was something like a, a thousand calories, you know, four days a week or so, you know, it was what she was finding had worked, but um, at the point when she discovered that, she was already so, you know, behind the eight ball with the weight that she couldn't 
make up any ground, you know, and I, I think that's what happened because she's as active as she was before. She still does a stim bike and she, she still does aquatic therapy. You know, she's, she hasn't increased her level of activity. So, well, what, makes me, what it makes me think about is that um, able-bodied people will go to a plastic surgeon in, in search of some, um, what do you call it? liposuction <laughs> and they can't have it um, as if they have some weight to lose if they have what they, they can use it maybe like as a body sculpting thing to get rid of that last little pocket of stubborn fat and it kind of makes me wonder gee I wonder if they just take out some of the fat to start with it can start the ball rolling on a more automatic weight loss program and if, boy if somebody wants to do a study on that I'll be in control group that'll <laughs> Go for the liposuction before losing one's <laughs> weight. Oh, you yeah, see, you sign the two of us up. We're in. <laughs> That's it, I guess. Any other questions this evening? No. All right. Well, thank you for your attention. It was uh, a lot of fun. Thank you so yeah. much for coming. Yes. Thank you.